home stretch. Hi, we're the Book Mavens. I'm Amanda, she's Rachel. Thanks for joining us on our Summer of Hob Reading Challenge. Today we're going to be discussing two of the books in the Rain Wild Chronicles. Book three, City of Dragons, and book four, Blood of Dragons. So this would be 12 and 13 in the Realm of the Elderlings overall story arch. What we have going on here for the third and fourth books, we are now, we start off outside of Kelsingra and they are trying to figure out a way to get into the city and then we see them explore the city and kind of once again trying to establish those relationships with their dragons that they're all elderlings now and what that journey looks like we also have the appearance of old characters coming back in malta and rain have been discussed malta had made an appearance they really take more of a centralized mm -hmm. role especially in the fourth book um to the storyline we get to find out more about what happens with Hest. Uh, we see um, from, as a Bingtown trader now that we know that um, Kelsinger is real now we see all of the traders want to, wanting to be able to come in and exploit that city and what that means and so we see Tintaglia come back we get to follow more of her storyline and what's been happening with her in Icefire as well as this kind of looming threat of the Chalcinians trying to come in to harvest dragon parts, which have been a kind of continual threat throughout all four books. And just how that story concludes and what's going to happen with them, as well as Selden, who's been off trying to find more dragons um, at the request of Tintaglia, and he is betrayed by his companions and is sold as a slave. So he ends up in Chalced as well and being held captive by the Duke and his storyline's very tragic. Um, yeah, it's kind of, yeah, yeah. To the spoilers. Where we are. <laughs> we have conquered the Rain Wild Chronicles, all four. We have thoughts. Mm. They're not spectacular thoughts. <laughs> I think it's overall. Kind of, mm. Yeah, we were, we were somewhat, I wouldn't say underwhelmed. I was just whelmed. I was whelmed. I like whelmed. that. Yeah. I wasn't overwhelmed. I wasn't just underwhelmed. Kind of whelmed. Just whelmed. This, the quality of the writing is great. It's just not a story that I was particularly attached to. There are some things she does that throws off a lot of, I feel like, um, themes that she, she stuck with through the other books, like especially in regards to looking at adolescence. Mm. Um, that really kind of threw me for a loop. I think, did we talk about that the last video too? Mm -mm. Well, just this whole idea that when you look at, say like Prince Dutiful and then Narcheska, you're talking about, you know, he's 15, she's 13, 12, that even going further back and you can look at uh, Katrickin is only supposed to be a teenager at the beginning of when she's, well, when she's introduced as a character. Like all of these things that these, Malta, Althea, <laughs> uh, Wintro. Wintro, yeah, Selden. You know, you have a lot of these young characters, I mean, very young characters that are taking on majorly adult roles and being treated as adults by the majority of the people around them. You know, at least participating in a lot of the decisions that are being made. Or at least wanting to be, because that was a big thing right. with like Malta. She's like, I will be a grown up. And you're like, right. okay. <laughs> when, she, when she really honestly acts very childish yeah. but is being kind of treated and being asked to be an adult and face those kind of adult consequences and being held accountable as an adult whereas these keepers that are all teenagers for the most part or in their early 20s are really treated as adolescents as being somehow incapable of making decisions for themselves especially when it comes to love which is very interesting since so many of the other characters, like Dutiful and Narcheska, were put together and encouraged to develop a, a romantic attachment. And I don't know if it's just because of a different level of status, but we were talking about these teenagers going off on this grand adventure to be keepers to dragons. And the expectation is not for them to come back and rejoin society. The whole expectation, I think, was for all of them to just go off and die. Yeah. But <laughs> just that why 
everyone else, like Left and crew and everybody treats them like children when they, they don't really act too much like children. I think they're trying Some to establish their own rules. I think that's a big thing. They're challenging this authority that they lived under in Treehog and Kasserick that they want to establish themselves as something else. And... And I, I mean, that's a tremendous amount of responsibility becoming elderlings. Now they have these tremendously long lives ahead of them. It was just a very different treatment to adolescents that um, really was just odd to me. And I honestly, the times when she really tried to play in, it, it read almost like a young adult novel series mm. that a lot of like the trials and tribulations, like this idea of a love triangle, I did not need that stuff. I honestly thought it was below Robin Hobb, not, not, to, not to lie. And I've read plenty of young adult fantasy fiction where the romance is there and there's a love triangle and that's all well and good. But coming this far into um, Hobb's writing and now having to deal with that, I I didn't like it. It was something I, I think that was the thing that I liked least about these books. I think you're right. It's just a different treatment. Like these mm -hmm. are treated honestly a lot more like you would expect adolescents to be treated mm -hmm. compared to all the characters in previous books. I do think on some level there's a little bit more accuracy to it here than there was in some of the earlier books in the sense that like in the last book they talk about how you know Rain who's older and now has a wife and a child now and he's watching them and he talks about how they're just kind of like going into riding dragons into battle like it's just another part of their day because it kind of is like the one of the beauties of adolescence is that they do live much a little bit more in the moment and they're mm. very flexible and adaptable and I think that that adaptability to the circumstance is very accurate in terms mm. of adolescence but I do agree that like there's a much different um it's just a much different style of writing about adolescence in general comparatively because, like, I feel like, like I've used that argument many times in previous books. Like, when we were talking about Wintro, I'm like, he's 15. But he'd been in such adult circumstances and written in such adult way that that really lost. And it's the same thing with Malta. Like, I had to try to really remember that she was a child and not to, like, it's in her early days. Malta, wow, what character growth. <laughs> yeah, well, what a girl. Well, definitely, we'll have a lot of discussion about her. Yes. Yeah. I think her and Rain, I mean, that storyline, especially in the fourth book, I mean, that was such that a was, good book. Such a good part of it on like such yeah. a good part of that book yeah all right okay. rab school and elise cool well rab school has been exploring kelson Gra on his own as well he be at um where we left off is really the only dragon right at he that point flies in time first that flies well but they're 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 in rags right and see this is a big thing right. they have nothing they have no supplies they're really just kind of living on the very fringe it's cold winter is here winter has arrived yeah mm -hmm. and so so she's so they, they can't stay warm. Now, she has that elderly robe that she's been wearing that Lefren gave yeah. her that kind of regulates all the temperature and stays clean. It's lovely. Well, um, Thimera and Rapskull discover this kind of treasure trove of el elderly fabric. And so they bring them back, and Elise just has a fit. These are artifacts that need to be studied. She didn't think about how much they're needed. It was a necessity to be able to use these things that are going to help them survive. And that's, of course, yeah, when the confrontation that, happens with Rapsky. It's that except, a, a obsession with the past and recording the past instead of finding ways to parlay that into the moment and the immediacy that is important. It is a great scene and a powerful moment for Elise that I really liked. It was hard. It mm -hmm. kind of hits you in the gut. But it's it's... She's such a tremendously resilient character to me. She's probably she one of my favorites because she keeps getting knocked down and she keeps coming back. Yep. Like the channel on the song. So I think that we as readers struggle sometimes with how mystical creatures are written. And Robin Hobb to me, I've always loved Tintaglia ever since Tintaglia made an appearance. I like it. I like the arrogance. It is very, it's, it's definitely a more traditionalized view of dragons. I, and this is somewhere where Amanda and I differed because Amanda had a hard, had time, a hard time her. really understanding why, like the selfishness of the dragons. It seemed like they just weren't empathetic to the humans. And, you know, we had a conversation where I, I just, 
how I see it, my perspective in terms of kind of interpreting Hobbes' viewpoint on dragons is that they they are a separate species. They're not an animal. They're not humans. They're their own thing. And she does point that out several times in her writing, that that is how we need to set up this frame. It is a new frame. So we can't keep looking at it and trying to, or looking at them and trying to place human characteristics on them. They're yeah. not human. And their expectations for their lives here as an apex predator, which is what we put them, they're at the top of the chain alongside us. And I think that they are a great mirror of humanity. We like to think that we as human beings are capable of so many good things, and we absolutely are, but we're capable of so many horrible, terrible things. And the dragons aren't terrible. They just, they don't really want to consider humankind as any kind of barrier to them being able to live their best life, so to speak. And that humans are there to be used for their purposes. And to me, it, it really is a reflection of, uh, of us uh, as a species. We do that. We have modified this planet to suit our needs. We haven't really, at least not for thousands of years, tried to slide ourselves into an existing ecosystem. We change everything around us to suit us. So to have a species that is highly intelligent to communicate and look at us as servants is like, whew, that's like a, this, it's a whole different perspective for us. And everything that we talked about with the fool in terms of how important it was to preserve them as a species to kind of keep us in check, I feel like that really plays out here. This idea of being able to have a symbiotic relationship, it's not really about dragons serving humans or being friends even. It's just a way to keep that kind of hubris in check for both sides because we see Tintagli is injured. The only way she's gonna survive is if she finds her elderlings, if she finds Malta and Rain and Selden to help her or she's going to die. And I think these realizations that have happened throughout this whole journey through these four books really point points that out, that they mm -hmm. do need each other but but both wants to, I think that's the thing too is that because both believe themselves to be superior yes it's like there's it's, right there's that conflict there because there's not a clearly superior species like humans I would argue like dragons are incredibly intelligent mm -hmm. and so but humans are also very intelligent and capable of you know survival and so you put these two together and they both they really I thought the conflict, I think what you're saying is really, yeah, there's a really a, great way to put it about the conflict. Yeah, we need to start with, stop with this domination idea. It's this idea of being able to share that, that top tier together. Right. And that's a very hard thing for us to and grasp. They don't want to. They because don't. They both, well, that's the thing, because both sides believe themselves to be the superior. But it's not even just that. You have Thimera's expectations that she's going to have this great relationship with her dragon. But where does that come from? We well, talk about that Elisa got, for say, expectations. That got crushed in book one. But, but those are her expectations. Well, and and it's unfair. I think, for her to put those expectations which I think Thymara on, as a character accepts pretty her. early on because she does but I think she always has a little bit of bitterness when it comes yeah. to they're not so well, close and I think hers was driven by one loneliness like she's very lonely yeah as an outcast and so that's where I think the original dream comes from and then I think it's that um there's that element of comparison about how comparison really does sometimes fester in us because she's looking at all these other dragon relationships and seeing how they're much you know, closer. Not all of them. They think they're that's very, true. That's they're true. very they're different. A, all the dragons have different personalities. Some of them are absolute terrors, like Spit, right? Yeah, Who's I really most... liked Spit when he yeah. was like kind of the underdog, and then mm -hmm. he just really, yeah, what the a... silver. He, yeah, he's, he becomes quite a bit. Even, even the other dragons like, like call mm -hmm. him like the evil one. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah just, no. But I mean that, but that, that makes him even more kind of as a once again a mirror to us that mm -hmm. there's different personalities Mercor obviously seems to have a little bit more empathy at least with Sylvie but he makes decisions that are going to be best for dragon kind he will dis disregard the wishes of the humans he's not he's never in a position of servitude but see you also have this whole other thing is like why should dragons be sympathetic to humans because all the humans want to do is they made this deal with Tintagli. They can't just slaughter them and sell their parts, right? So they're just going to go off. They just want them to go off and die. And then mm -hmm. you have the Chalcidians, because their duke is dying. Well, we need to harvest those dragon parts. They're just looking for what they can get out of the dragons to make their lives better. So how are we any better than the dragons? Like I also think that it's really, to me, like for Centara, for example, 
that it's only until she really becomes a true dragon in her own eyes that I feel like she can accept and develop more in terms of building a relationship with Thimera. Oh, I really, the, yeah, yeah, I really I feel like that was a big, that was a big problem is that Centara is struggling. All of them are struggling with this concept in their minds that they have of what it is to be a true dragon and these kind of broken forms that they have and having to teach themselves how to fly. This is outside of anything in their, in their mm -hmm. memories to have to deal with. And I think they feel just so outside of what they should be. They just can't focus on mm -hmm. anything else but that. And I have, I've got to be honest, like trying to put myself in the dragon's talons, so to speak. Hey. hey. <laughs> um, that I think I would be concerned about that too. Like I, my concern would not be for these people who kind of get signed on. They're literally labeled as their keepers. Well, that's their role to the dragons. You know, why would they treat me differently when they're so consumed with this idea that for thousands of years I existed in this way and now look at me. That would be hard. I think that's, I think that's such a, I think it's probably one of the best moments between Daimara and Centara uh, towards the end. They actually finally have that, that not conversation, but like it finally occurs to Thymara and Centara finally actually says it like, now that I don't need you anymore, I'm ready to have, yeah. you know, be more open with you. You don't and like want have it to be based on me. Right. Because she's, she says that. I think, I think yeah. she even uses that phrase. Mm -hmm. You can't like, so she's like, well, you never liked me. She goes, you can't like someone that you're dependent on. Yeah. It, it, and to her as a dragon, which I think really kind of like you really beautifully encapsulated there, but. But it's, you also see it with Tintaglia, and Tintaglia obviously had a lot of arrogance, but it's this idea when oh, she's Tintaglia. hurt. She's hurt. She's been wounded by humans, and she hates the Chalcedonians. They, they lay waste oh to the capital city. <laughs> Spoiler alert. And um, But that she realizes that she, she's she been changed by her contact with humans. She Yes, she's with Ice Fire, but he's this ancient dragon, and she realizes she that she's, like she doesn't <laughs> like him. Poor thing. But he's the only one left to her. She doesn't think those other dragons, those other that they made it you know she has no idea what's going on they're very very far away and so she's wounded but she realizes that she needs she needs to come back and she starts I think really reflecting on what those relationships are Selden that she sent him off she doesn't feel him anymore or Malta or Rain and she goes back to her elderlings because there is a trust there mm -hmm. that if I go back they will help me and and I think that really comes full circle because she does help them Malta and Rain are struggling she Malta gives birth in the most horrendous conditions you could ever think and Malta has grown substantially we'll talk oh, more Malta. about her but you know her, so this baby we talked about the the changes that happen not all of them are controlled changes and that causes the death and this is what deaths this is why so many rain wild children die is that these changes aren't being regulated or controlled by the dragons mm -hmm. because the dragons hadn't existed right for a long time and so they need Tintaglia to to fix what has gone wrong and the changes in their baby and Tintaglia does it she's dying and she still saves that baby but not only that I think at the end when they're all of the dragons have come on to the capital city in Chalced that she hears Selden and comes and saves Selden finally she didn't have finally to do that I mean literally disregards everyone else and she comes and she saves Selden and chess in, but we'll talk about that. I like something you and I talked about earlier yeah. in the week about how they come around is what I'm trying to say. You know, Marker's <laughs> pointed out that yeah. humans are changed by the dragons, but dragons also are changed by humans. Mm -hmm. And I think Tintaglia, you can see now because her elderlings are all people with these very deep familial bonds. Like, oh, yeah. you know, the Vestrit family motto is family first. And then you have like, um, Rain and his like the traitor family and the you know the Rain Wilds are even especially tight knit as a community not even just family but she, so she's bonded herself to these individuals who have deep familial loyalty and, and that's abnormal for dragons right. dragons are solitary and she's looking for like she know, realizes that with yeah, ice fire she realizes she's been following ice fire and she's like why am I following them around and then that's not normal looking, behavior yeah she's she goes looking, looking for, for her elderlings kind of. I think that's maybe yeah. one of the things that was changed in Tintaglia is that she recognizes that she likes the companionship but it's also the other dragons that Mercor kind of becomes a leader mm -hmm. right so that they're all 
the dragons are working together cohesively, which is not typically what they did unless there was an outside threat mm -hmm. where they needed more than one dragon to come together. And so this idea that now because they they a lot of them still existed in Malkin's Tangle, who is now Merkur the Dragon, that he was a, in a leadership position yeah. then, and they have those serpent memories, and now they're they're together again, and that relationship has been established and now has been kept. So it's like a new step in terms of the relationships now between the Elderlings and the dragons, and the dragons themselves with each other. Everything has changed. Oh yeah. Such a great ending to a character. Oh, hissed. It was right up there with, what's his face? Uh, Regal. Regal. <laughs> Regal in them. With the weasel. The, the weasel. <laughs> I mean, it's right up there with that in I terms of taking out. I will never look at a weasel the same way. <laughs> taking out a character. So, yes, Hest, the worst of the worst, right? So, we have him, we leave off with, he's in Bingtown just, you know, living his best life. Well, now he's been confronted with the Chalcedonians who had made that deal with Cedric. Cedric. We'll get back to him in terms of harvesting dragon parts. Now they're holding Hest accountable for that. So, now Hest is being dragged. He's, he brings his new lover with him, and he gets killed along the way. And so he's being forced. He's in the subservient position to the Chalcedonian. Yeah, he's he, a lord. He basically gets terrorized. He does. To, he gets poisoned and all. Yeah, and is just treated really roughly. But you know, talk about somebody like, who needed to be taken down a few notches. He definitely does. But the oh, it was even, it was a bit much even for me. <laughs> it's kind of like it reminded me of Kyle Haven, like where I really didn't like him, but I was like, oh, okay. it's rough. But that end is like, whoa, geez. But then at the very oh, very end, it's so good. Mm -mm, mm -mm. So he's they're all on the shore. The keepers are arguing about what to do with them. Well, his big acting. You talk about that. Yeah. He comes up. Oh, Elise, my yeah. beloved my wife. My darling. And she just is like, <laughs> what? this is my actual nightmare. So <laughs> she, but I will say she has, I, again, Elise being one of my favorite characters to read in her internal dialogue. I think she's just so relatable. She has this moment of like, oh my gosh, she's going to destroy everything I built. And then she makes a choice in that moment to not allow that to happen. Mm -hmm. And I love that she doesn't let anybody else. Um, she won't let Left Turn go she and She didn't let Left Turn go. She steps, she, because Left Turn, of course, but I love that dynamic for them. Yeah. He respects her and he lets her handle, he lets her handle her own things and do what she wants. Um, he's a real, it's a partnership which mm -hmm. I always admire in relationships when they're a true partnership. Yeah. But he, she doesn't allow anyone. She steps up and says, no, our marriage is dissolved. You were unfaithful to me from the beginning. And no, she like, she doesn't even let him get far. And he's saying all this stuff oh, about, yeah, no. he oh, you're. To, tries to deny all of it. Yeah, and then no, finally, never. a redeeming moment. Such four books are coming. Cedric finally has a redeeming moment. It's about, I'm not going to He's lie. such a whiner. That's it's a big thing. Time. Ugh. He whined through so much. I mean, Carson even calls him lazy Boontown book. boy. Like, endearingly, but like, oh, you lazy <sighs> Boontown boy. Constantly comparing just living on the edge of survival with Boontown. Obviously, it's a different situation. Everybody wants a warm bath. Trust me. But. I think he does have this moment, though, where he realizes God, that. He, he doesn't. And he starts, like, he realizes that Carson takes it when he complains as like, I need to fix it. Finally he's like, shuts I'm up. just saying it to say it. Like, <laughs> I don't really need up. to do it. So I think he's, you know, I think he has growth. Yes. But anyway, so he, <laughs> like, it is, he thinks yeah. he's safe because the Chalcidian who's been terrorizing him is dead. He's dead he now. died in the aftermath of the battle. Got yeah. eaten by a dragon. Sure did. Uh, and then, so he gets there and he sees, he spots Elise. And he spots Cedric. Ooh. Elise, he steps forward and says... No, I will testify because I know you were unfaithful because you were unfaithful with me. Mm -hmm. And like, well, he outs himself in a society in which that does. is not acceptable. Yep. And he basically cuts cuts himself off from any chance that he'll ever go back, which he had decided he was not going to go back. And But he has this great moment and it's such a good. Well, I mean, it shatters anything that, I mean, with him saying that and making those statements, Hess' story would never hold, hold water. Yeah. I I think it was such a great there's a great moment between him and Elise that for me is gave me a lot to think about when it comes to forgiveness because she says to him as after he says it she goes I already forgave you and he says that's true but I wasn't I hadn't done anything to deserve that at least now hopefully I've shown you that I really 
am sorry that I really have changed. Like, and I think that's such a, I thought it was just, it gave me a lot to think about, about forgiveness and about, mm -hmm. you know, saying you're sorry versus actually changing your behavior and doing things to try to, you, he knows he can't correct it, but at the very least he can stop yeah. the anguish that, you know, that that had caused. But it's such a great moment. So then Hest is, of course, and then I love it. She, Lefton just comes up and he comes like, we were going to get to you. Wanna go? Yeah. Like, and they just kind of walk off from him, which for Hess is probably the most insulting thing you could have done is just dismiss mm -hmm. his importance. And then, so then they're in the bath. That just makes his end so much better. This, yeah. is, this idea that he has this, ex, this supreme self-importance mm -hmm. that he has. And just gets dismissed. It's just, it's just perfect though. Sorry, go ahead. So then, no, <laughs> yeah, but then, so then later he, he, uh, well, he tries to manipulate Davy. He tries to manipulate Davy as a way to get vengeance on Carson and Cedric, but mm -hmm. also because he's Hest and he's awful. But Davy stands up for himself, which I loved, mm -hmm. which I think Punches led, I think led to a great moment for him and Carson about respecting him as an adult and not just as, which I, as someone who has a yeah. large family and I'm kind of in the older set of like grandchildren and cousins, I look at my, sometimes I have to remind myself that they are basically adults. Or, you know, because I want them to be, you know, my littles forever. But they're, they're grown-ups who make their own choices. I thought it was such a great growth moment that you see in families. But mm -hmm. then Cedric has his opportunity with Hess to really confront and say no. And I'm not going to let you manipulate His own anymore. abuse. And to be able to see him trying to use those same tactics on somebody else, I think, was right. very eye-opening for Cedric. And, yeah, it has that confrontation. And that Cedric now has grown into being a man. Mm -hmm. And punches Hest as well. <laughs> so, so, yeah, so yeah. both of those two actually get mm -hmm. great closure, mm -hmm. but even before his story, like, ends in the book, which I really loved yeah. that they're both independent of each other, too, because Elise has that he's moment. no longer important in their lives. Yeah. I think that's a big, that's a big thing, and that dismissal, so important. Yeah, I loved it, that they both had separate moments. Elise had her moment to confront him and say no, even before Cedric stepped forward and, like, basically verified what she was saying. And then, but Cedric also has this moment because this is more private. It's just him and um, Davy, and he sends mm -hmm. Carson away so that they can have this moment privately. I liked that they each had this individual closer to realize that they real that he really did have no power over them anymore. Yeah, and then it's a big moment I think as well for survivors of abuse mm -hmm. to be able to pave your own way and to leave that behind for that trauma now is not forgotten or forgiven in any way. I think, but it's. I, that you can live with it and be able to move forward without fear. And I think that she illustrates that very, very well. Yeah, it was very well uh, done. Yeah. Very well written. And then, <laughs> so then tell them what happens. So then tell them what happens to him. Hold on a second. I forgot the name of the dragon. What did Ice fire. No. No, it's Ice fire. Ice fire? No, it's Callow. Mm, it's Ice fire. No, dear. Okay, let's pause. Let's hold on. Before the... I thought I just said Hest. I read Ice fire. It's not Ice fire. Oh, you're right, you're right. Davy serves me. I could have sworn that it's it was... It's not Ice Fire. I could have sworn that it was Ice Fire. No. How did I think that? I don't know. Well, Kylo had remarkable restraint at first <laughs> just to listen to him. Oh, I think I think it just made okay. it better that he was that way. It just kind of plays him. Plays Hest. I was okay. wrong. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. So, so Kylo was down in the baths, right? And so Hest now is by himself. There are guards outside. Okay. Now, Hest is, sees Callow and he realizes, well, he want, he decides, well, I still need a piece of the city. Why don't, I should become an elderling. So he decides he's going to go try and manipulate Callow, the largest dragon. Just put that out there, right? So he approaches Callow. Callow has expressed. Um, he says, come here, dragon. And you're just <laughs> well, immediately, as a reader, you're like, ooh. No, but it's not even just mm -hmm. that. It's this idea that, that Hest now... It, something Callow says makes him think that he is displeased or does not want Davy as his keeper anymore. So Hess think he, thinks he has an in to replace Davy and take over Callow. And so, yes, tries to summon him, treats him like an animal. Yes. And he says, says, he goes, what does your owner call you? And you're, and as a reader, the master, whole time, the whole master. Thing, yeah. You're three books in and you're just like, Oh no, ooh, no. Mm -hmm. You're doing everything you should not because do. Because he disregards everything around him. Hess is just, mm, Yes, tries to treat him like he was like training a horse. I think is what he compares it to. And Callow is just like, just studying. He's kind of watching <laughs> this all happen. Yeah, yeah. And says, "I'm going to call you Blue Glory, and you can call me 
Blue Glory's master. He decides he's going to rename Glory's master. Glory's, yeah, something Glory. like that, yeah. Something ridiculous. And, and, and Kala this whole time is just, like, watching him. You know, like, you could just imagine, like... I don't know, like a well, they talk about because they talk about mouth. how the dragon eyes are like really yeah, spinning like when they're thinking. There's yeah. like you just see it going, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and then he that says, did it. That doesn't go well. Tries to summon the dragon to him, and <laughs> nope. <laughs> Callum makes a lunge. Has things he's gotten away. He's in the water. He gets plummeted into the very very Calls hot bath. bath. And thinking that he got away, but he feels some pain on his legs. Gone. Callum has snatched off his leg, and he's screaming. And Callum just eats him. And not well, only Kalo says, Kalo says, because he, he's like, what do you call me? And Kalo goes, I think I'll call you delicious. And you're <laughs> yeah. like, yes. oh, yeah, that's right. And, uh, <laughs> and then Kalo just gets up, doesn't think to tell anyone he just ate someone. Mm -mm. So that is the best end for Hess because then at the end, they're kind of like, where did Hess go? He disappeared. So they think that he's out loose somewhere in Kalsingra or beyond. Nobody has seen him. The guards never saw him exit the building. They have no idea. Kalo, it is beneath him. It's just he's like already he had just picked about a sheep it. off like he's the, like, the he's hillside. Just, it is done. This 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 stupid human. He's just come challenge me food now. That's it. Yeah, and uh, that's the end of Hess. They still at the end they have no idea. But there's no, but it's perfect because they had already Elise and Cedric had already had their moment. Had so their moment. Closure. No fear of him anymore. It was the perfect end for Hess. This completely just non glorified just disappearance to be eaten by a dragon. It was the yeah. perfect, like the weasel. It was just for, for It was, it was like Regal. the weasel. It was. I for love Regal. it. I love these just kind of almost embarrassing ends that they get because yeah, that's what they deserve. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine a better ending for Hest than yeah. that. Uh, the reappearance of Rain and Malta. I think Rain is significant because he does ride on Tintaglia to, um, <laughs> To much, storm much to Malta's annoyance. Yeah. I love that part that she's yes. annoyed. He's like, he just gave birth. Like, we have a child that you're feeding. It's not that he's gone. It's yeah. that she she's doesn't not get riding to go. Tantaglia. Yeah. And you're yeah. just like, it's like, that's like, perfect Malta. Like, oh, Malta. Little, little fire. She's little still fireball. in there. <laughs> well, I mean, she just, everything about her story is tragic. And mm -hmm. as, as a fellow mother, I can't imagine a worse fear than having to give birth under extremely rough circumstances. And than to have this baby that is just slowly dying and she's just watching her baby die and it's about those changes and and just holding on one last hope i just gotta get to the dragons they get to the dragons and the dragons say nope we can't fix you tintaglia does well tintaglia's not there then tintaglia comes but tintaglia is dying not only is tintaglia dying but she needs silver to be able to fix the baby so it's just like one obstacle after another and then finally yeah. they're able to save that baby and I, that is to me that journey through the story was the most urgent to me. Everything right. else, I think that's just kind of meandered yeah. for me. But that was the only storyline that I was just like, <gasps> yeah, I got to see how, if that baby's going to make it. So I do. I okay. Uh, at yeah. series as a whole, yeah. I just didn't feel as connected to these, and I think some of it didn't is, need to be four books. Yeah, they're that's very my short. Issue. And I mean, on the one hand, I I liked that they were quicker reads, but mostly. I just felt like the pacing was not as good as in her other series because most of this stuff that we talked about doesn't happen till the fourth book. Like mm -hmm. the storyline with the silver and it being important is very teased very little in the beginning. And in the fourth book, it's just suddenly like the thing. And I feel like the resolution with that, it all just moves so quickly compared to the way, cause that's supposed to be like the big thing in this storyline and compared to her other trilogies where, you know, the big thing is there or plays a more important teased out role. Mm -hmm. It just felt really fast in, in some respects and then really slow in others. I just felt like the pacing was kind of off on this. Could have done without all of the teen drama. I could have just had that wiped. Yeah. Honestly, I did not care about any of that stuff. I didn't care about all this stuff, like throughout the all four books with Greft and the Jerd, that's her name. Um, and all with her deciding that she's just going to sleep with all of these males, the whole love triangle with Rab School, Thimera, and Tats, I did not need any of that. I was to say, None I just of that wasn't was invested in me. it. I just yeah, no, I didn't care. There wasn't this like overarching urgency like there has been in everything else. Like in the Far Seers, it was, you know, saving them from invasion and then it was getting them getting the dragon to save the the alliance. And then even in the Bingtown Traders, it was saving the ships. It's like like the war with Chalcid, that was maybe twenty pages. 
Yeah, it kind of reminded me at the end of the Far series. You remember where she's yeah. like, and then the dragons cleaned up, and you're like, wait, wait, wait. I spent three books getting here. And then we spent four. Nothing? And I just, it was just very, very little. And I could understand this idea. I think it set, sets up like the dragons being so just physically superior to be able to just lay waste to an entire city. Yeah. Like, I get it, but. The only real political intrigue we got in this was through the bird keepers. I feel like I that was, that. and that was very interesting. I like how she did it, but there There's wasn't enough of it favorite. that went through, <laughs> except for when Lefteren was in Kasserik, or Treehog, which I forget which city he ends up going in, and where he has He's to meet up with friend. the traders and the traders council to be able to get paid and they realized mm -hmm. well they thought they were going to get all of, like the river route and everything all this information but that wasn't in their original yeah, he, contract he, he and knows. alice had carefully read the contract and prepared that yeah. he didn't owe them any of that and then they tried to prevent him from leaving so there's a lot of drama with that there is kind of betrayal within the council it was a very small time when really i'm just I just the like downplay it, it of the threat the of Chalced, yeah. I really wish that had been more of a focus because Chalced not only, I mean, they did mention the six duchies like one time, and that was with Chalced having a new leader now with the Duchess, which is the Duke's daughter that he had kind of been holding captive. That's a whole other deal. But the yeah. she ends up becoming a ruler, but she had established a relationship with Selden, who was being held captive there, where the Duke was draining his blood because he's a dragon man and that that was going to kind of act as a placeholder until like they could get worse. dragon it was hearts. Kind of working too. It was very, yeah, it was very it gross. It was too much for me, to be honest with you. That was a little, it was just a little too icky. It was very vampire-like that just didn't, I didn't need that. I didn't like it. And the abuse Selden faced, it was very kind of graphically yet not practically talked about right. it was very it and it didn't seem to like i just don't know i just didn't see its purpose like i didn't feel the need for that and but i mean i did love tentaglia coming yeah. and saving him and chas at the end but but it was right at the end and it was like a pet two pages. was it necessary to have him be on like this brink of death thing for so long well, in the book. I, think I, just you, I think you could have brink brink of death him without a lot of the lot drama of the stuff, that yeah. he went through and i i just didn't i just don't know how necessary it was it didn't yeah. seem to really do anything in terms of the character story. development or the story it just didn't move anything i along. mean so and, it seemed almost gratuitous to me yeah yeah um I mean, there's there's a lot of, like, if you want to compare it to something like Game of Thrones, for example, which has a tremendous amount of violence and very graphic violence and, uh, like, the topic of rape. And some of it is gratuitous, but sometimes there's, like, a purpose in terms of character development and growing from trauma. You just don't get that with Selden. And so it just and felt... Unless it comes later, but I just don't I, see it. I don't think so. We only have three books left. And from what I understand, it really doesn't focus on anything dealing with the Rainwild. It's going to be back in the Six Duchies with Fitz. So I'm kind of, yeah, I'm kind of in the and same the position I was when we read Fool's Fate, the, end, the, the previous trilogy, the final book. I could see where this could kind of like, it just... I don't see that linking tie that makes me want to keep going that so I saw in the earlier. This. Yeah, this is where we disagree. <laughs> this is where we disagree. I feel the same way that I did last time where I'm like, I could see where this would have been the end and like kind of, you know, I don't feel this urgency to continue to keep finding out some other mystery. Like I'm satisfied. I think what we're going to, see, well, I don't know. This is just a, a prediction that could be totally false but this idea that with the last trilogy of course we're going to be see fits but at the end of fool's fate and the fool just goes back to his previous or their previous school um to share all the information that's passed to me the fool story is still very much unfinished it's this idea that he or they have to completely rewrite their life now that it was supposed to have ended and now what are they going what are they going to do and I want to know, I want to be able to see the fool have some kind of personal happiness or direction. So I want to see that story. Amanda's satisfied I'm, I'm with where satisfied it is. I'm just satisfied where we are. So <laughs> I, mean, tell us I would like to see it. Tell us in the comments. Yeah. Are you, are you, if this was the end, would you be satisfied? Or kind of like Rachel, you want to go pick up that last big thread that was just it also helps that Robin Hobbs is a great writer. And she's gonna she's gonna spin a good that's tale. The thing is like I enjoy. So, that's the I think that's part yeah. of this thing. Is like it is a story. It's a good story. Like she told a good story. 
I'm just not as emotionally invested in it as I was with some of the earlier. Well, trilogies. I also want to see if there's going to be any connection with these regarding the silver. Yes, those are silver well there, but you mm -hmm. also know that there's another place within the six duchies where they went where there's a whole sil silver river. Yeah, that was because that was the only real time he put his hands like in previous books. But it was so at they the don't end, mention it felt it. so rushed that I was like, I wait, hold on, yeah. was that what I think it is? And it was. So maybe in the next books, maybe we'll, well see. It was very interesting too, like when. Thimera uses the silver because we know that the silver is used to create these incredible things within mm -hmm. the ring wall. There's all of those elderly goods, right? The elderlings. Right, to, to use it. So they have to use gloves made out of dragon skin, which is kind of interesting. And then to be able to use the silver, but the process is super tedious. Like, there has to be more. To Maybe there's the more use that they just silver. don't know. Yeah, I mean, just everything about it, it still feels, everything with the six duchies and everything that we got with Elisha Traders in the Rain Riled Chronicles still feels incredibly separate. Mm. I would like to see more tie-in. Well, and we've only got one more trilogy to do it. Poorly tough. Okay, go with me on this. Okay, I'm there. Okay, I'm here. I'm on the bus. Okay. It might could even be frozen pizza because you know how the, okay, when the toppings shift, or the toppings are not layered evenly, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. A poorly layered slice of pizza, where one bite might be all cheese and sauce. Another bite, you might get some of the toppings. And then every once in a while, you get a perfect bite where there's a little bit of everything on the pizza. So it's a, it's a for me, it's gonna be a badly, and you enjoy it, because pizza's like one of my favorites. Pizza mm -hmm. and Ron. I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. listen, I'm basically, yeah, pizza <laughs> basically a college student, uh, taste-wise, uh, but, if when when you don't get that even distribution of toppings, then each bite is different, and some of them are just kind of like. Mm. But you like it because you like pizza, but it's not a great pizza because it's not like a perfect bite every time. The toppings are not laid out in such a way that you're getting all the flavors every time. Only every once in a while do you get all the flavors. So you're getting a little bit of this mm. all with one bite, and a little bit of that feeling with another bite, and then sometimes you just get the bland cheese and cheese and sauce. That's what I'm gonna go with. I'm gonna go with a. I'm going to add on Un, yours. Yeah, unevenly layered piece of pizza. Okay, so we go with the frozen pizza example. And typically when you get a frozen pizza, you guys probably all have done this, is that, yeah, the toppings all shift. So they all tend to move to one side. Now, typically when I open one, I look at it and decide, okay, I need to move these toppings around so I get a more satisfactory pizza mm -hmm. altogether. So that's kind of like what I wanted to do with this book. I wanted to either like, maybe it was like a supreme pizza. I'm not the biggest fan of mushrooms. I'd like to just pluck those mushrooms off that pizza. That would be all of the teen adolescent drama garbage that I don't like. So just, just plucking those off the pizza and then rearranging things or I want more coverage of some things. I would have liked more po more politics. I would have liked more in terms of the conflict with Chalced. That's, those are the things I want. So I would want to rearrange my frozen pizza toppings, mm -hmm. I think is what I like. Cause there, there are good things about this these books. There are good things. I liked, I mean, I love the dragons. I will never yeah. not love the dragons. Anything dealing with the dragons, I was there for. I just, I, to me, the mushrooms, the teen adolescence drama really killed these books for me. It was not, it was not for me. Coming off of all the other ones, which were written in such more kind of rich detail with just more, um, just with more feeling, more emotion, I just couldn't invest in those adolescent characters, except for like Thimera. Yeah. And even Tats kind of went up and Let down me say for this. me. You're not going to be sorry that you read these books. No. Because it's Robin Hobb. Robin Hobb is a master of her craft. I mean, mm -hmm. what a phenomenal storyteller. Because so, even her, what we feel is the most whelming mm -hmm. story of all the ones we've read was still so good and we still enjoyed it. It was just... When no, you I'm can, not sorry. Yeah, it's just it's in comparison, it's not our favorite. Which we see. So tell us what you think in the comments. Yeah. Do you, like, yeah. How did you feel about this, trilo this uh, sorry, this quartet? This quartet compared to the other trilogies in the series. Or do you want, like, just tell us what you think. Yeah, was there what? a character that you liked that we didn't talk about? Yeah, what storylines did you gravitate to and which ones did you feel like could have been left aside? If any. Um, yeah, we'd really like to know. We'd like to continue the discussion with you guys in the comments. Yeah. So we're almost at the end of our Summer of Hob Reading Challenge, and I'm really proud of us. <laughs> uh, we're, we're almost also, there. Yeah, we're almost there. And we're It's almost back to school time. 
<laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> we've been having such a good time on this. Um, I kind of can't believe we're on the last trilogy. It's kind of like, wow, what a ride. Uh, but join us next week. Next week, we are going to start the final trilogy. We are going to be reading Fool's Assassin, which is the first book in the Fitz and the Fool trilogy mm -hmm. and the final trilogy of the Realm of the Elderling series. See you next time. Bye. All I'm saying is that the very last book, there's Fitz and there's a big dragon behind him. I'm hoping that means that my dragons come back, but in connection with Fitz, who I love and adore. Just, just add us, and not that creepy girl with the girl on the dragon. She needs you don't to know, just, can you see? She might no, be. Stop it, don't even. <laughs> there should never be anything like that ever illustrated, ever. That was the creepiest girl, girl on the dragon. I can't. Can't. That's for that sure going to be our outro clip. <laughs>